freue mich sehr, heute Lawrence Smith bei ihm vorzustellen und sein Buch Die Welt in 2050. Besonders in den letzten Jahren und auch in den letzten Monaten wurde uns wieder vor Augen gebracht, wie schnell sich die Welt verändert. In Japan, in Haiti, in Louisiana, aber auch in Ägypten und Tunesien und anderen Ländern im Nahen Osten sehen wir, dass sich unser Leben sehr schnell fürs Bessere oder auch fürs Schlechtere ändern kann. Und ich denke, die ganzen Finanzkrisen der letzten Jahre haben uns alle ein bisschen verunsichert. Wir brauchten eigentlich einen Kristallball, um zu wissen, was auf uns zukommt. Aber ich glaube, der ist uns jetzt ein bisschen zu altmodisch. Change is not just a political idiom today. It's also something, not, maybe not a force of nature, but it is certainly a part of nature. And I think Professor Smith, who teaches at UCLA, is the geoscientist that can put all of these elements together for what is happening to us in terms of demographics, in terms of economic integration, in terms of climate change and globalization. And it's a real honor to be here tonight and introduce him. But let me turn this over to you and Professor Adebeck right now. Thank you. Thank you so much for the very warm welcome, both of you. And what a pleasure and honor to be here in Frankfurt speaking to you all tonight. Uh, thank you so much for coming in. A little bit of background on, on me and on the project. I am um, I'm not a book author. I'm primarily a scientist, in fact, a climate change scientist. The goal here is to take, stop if we can for a moment, all of us, and remove ourselves from this recession, <laughs> remove ourselves from uh, this place, maybe even from Germany, and let's step back out of Germany, out of this short term, and take a very big, long-term view of the world over the next four decades. And this is not to say this is a prediction of the future, but rather a projection of where our current path is headed if we don't change something. So many of these outcomes can still be averted, and frankly, it's my hope, let's hope that they will. But at the moment, this is the path we seem to be on. In April 2006, a very strange thing happened. This is an amazing story. In fact, I, I start off the book with the story of this man. His name is James Martell. He's an American big game hunter from Idaho. He's rich. And he, in 2006, he paid a bundle of money to go to Canada to shoot a polar bear. Hunting polar bears is legal in Canada. You, you, you just have to pay $50,000 to do it. So he paid the money. He had these guides, uh, these two guides, to take him. And they took him out in a Canadian Arctic. They found him a polar bear. He shot it. They ran up excited to look at their prize and their excitement turned to confusion because it looked like a polar bear but upon closer inspection something wasn't quite right it had dark eyes like a panda circles under its eyes it had long hooked claws it had a hump on its back in fact it had many of the physical attributes of what the grizzly bear that's right Ladies and gentlemen, what you're looking at is the first ever documented occurrence of a grizzly bear, polar bear, seen in the wild. Shot in 2006. Last year, one year ago, a second one was shot. This one was the offspring of one of those hybrids. So not only has it happened, but they're not sterile. These creatures are reproducing, they're breeding. No. For this to happen required a grizzly bear to push far north into polar bear territory, which is something that biologists are beginning to see, along with very erratic behavior of polar bears. But is it concrete evidence of global warming? I don't know. I'm a scientist, and no reputable scientist would take two events like this and attribute them to anything. Time will tell whether this is just an oddity or the arrival of the heralding of a new hybrid species on Earth in response to global warming. But what I do trust are seminal studies like these appearing in some of the top journals in all of science that run the statistical analyses on hundreds of biological studies done over the years, crunching the numbers and finding that on average the world's plants and animal species are moving north at a rate of 6.1 kilometers per decade. On average, some are moving faster, some are moving slower. That number may not sound like much to you, but it translates to almost two meters a day. So imagine coming out of your apartment 
every morning and seeing that your lawn has crawled north by two meters from the day before. <laughs> That's very, very fast. It's my fervent hope that anyone who sees a narrative of a world where we're going to the Arctic to drill out the last drips of oil, because that's, that's how desperate we've become, would wake up and would think very strongly about changing the current trajectories that we're on. This is not a prediction, it's a projection. It's a lesson of, of where we're headed if these trends continue without intervention today.